Thank you. I'm uh, delighted to be here. I appreciate the, uh, the invitation. OK. Um, I'm uh, notwithstanding the, uh, the snow and the cold, which is really tough on a wimpy ca Southern Californian like myself. Um, but I'm delighted to be here with my friend uh, Emily Broadlieb. And I should also mention that uh, uh, Peter Barton Hutt, who teaches food and drug law here at Harvard, has been a longtime mentor and friend. I was just with him in Italy and uh, was talking to him about this uh, food law society you have here at Harvard. And uh, I want to commend the society and the law school uh, for having this wonderful idea, this wonderful group. Uh, Twelve years ago, when I was sitting in my law office, bored to death, I picked up a article written by the Harvard Business Review on the future of food, and it really pricked my interest. I grew, I'd grown up on a small farm, fruit and vegetable farm. My dad was in the, a produce broker. We lived on the West Coast. So food was very much a part of my life. Now, I had always equated food with really hard work, and so I decided to go to law school to get away from food. But as I matured, I, I began to think about food and my experiences a little differently. And after reading the article, I did some research and then made a decision that changed my life. I left my practice and enrolled in an LLM program at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville. Now, when I made, it, on agricultural law. Now, when I made that, it was the only such program in the country. And when I made that decision, uh, my partners at the law firm were very concerned for me. I remember the president of the firm called me in and offered me the use of the firm psychological counseling services. And I remember his words, food, agriculture's dead. Nobody talks about it. Why don't you go get an LLM at Yale or Georgetown? My, my, my focus and practice was international law at the time. And uh, nevertheless, I took a, a big risk and uh, took my family with me. And, we were in Arkansas for a year, and then a couple years later, I was invited back to join the faculty, and the rest is history for me. Um, but I, and I began to migrate very quickly from agricultural law to food law, which is, has more of an, or ag law has more of an emphasis on farmers and production, and has long been a legal discipline. Food law and policy has more of an emphasis on consumers and consumption. But uh, so for me, it's been a long, a long, interesting uh, story that's taken me all around the world in some interesting places. As I began to examine the history of food law, and I've always enjoyed history. Uh, in fact, I'm a, I, I wish that I had been a his, historian sometimes. But uh, nevertheless, food has a wonderful, rich history. Quoting the legal his, historian Lawrence Friedman, uh, history of law is not or should not be a search for fossils, but a study of social development unfolding through time. Modern law, he writes, is always up to date. It responds to social challenges. It is a mirror to society. Now, the history of food labeling law is a fascinating commentary on both what we think of food and our social values. It shouldn't be a surprise when we think about how much time we spend every day consuming food, preparing food, setting the table, doing the dishes, finding a restaurant, thinking about food, writing, uh, reading about food. Food consumes us as we consume food. Now, in, 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 and in some cases, when we think about food and social values, especially in the modern US, these values are not settled. Hence, a number of controversies have emerged over food label labeling that I will present to you today in the form of dichotomies. But before we get ahead of ourselves, um, addressing this uh, connection between social values and food labeling law also underscores the importance of the label. Now, we live in a time when most of the food that you and I consume is purchased with a label. This label is limited in size and, as a result, can only convey the most essential information. 
begs the question, from whose, pers from whose perspective? The food company, the government, or the consumer? On this slide, I have law in quotation marks, signifying that law as a legal tool with respect to food labeling is proving to be quite expansive, especially as it attempts to reflect certain social values. Hence, we now have what we call soft law, or voluntary or private standards that emanate from retailers by way of contract through the food supply chain that end up as certifications or labeling statements uh, of certain, uh, that, that communicate certain social values and builds brand and trust with consumers, such as animal credence statements. We also have an explosion of class action litigation over labeling terms such as natural that reflect, again, social values that are not incorporated in government regulation. So this law is a very expansive term, and it means a lot of different things. I recently, I have been teaching in China now for about 10 years, a food law and policy course. When I first started teaching at the law school, the students would show up because I was a curiosity. I speak English, I'm tall, I write with my left hand. Um, I, was, I was something, I, I felt like an animal in a zoo, sort of. And, uh, but now, when I teach, the class is filled up because there has been a sea change amongst the students in terms of their attitudes towards food. It's been amazing to see the change. Uh, it's been, in fact, it's been uh, remarkable. Uh, last year I was in uh, China speaking at a conference and it, there were two or three law deans and professors and students at this conference. And the, uh, the, the uh, head of the Shanghai District Court invited me to come to court the next day. So I took my entourage, the dean of the law school and some professors and a translator with me. We sat down in the courtroom and they had my name on a big neon sign as they do in China announcing my, my presence which I thought was kind of cool. And uh, I, I sat down and the senior judge then had a handout. And on this handout were a number of court cases that the judges at the district court in Shanghai had been hearing on food labeling cases. It's remarkable. The new Chinese food law allows for citizen complaints. They actually showed me where the citizens can go and file these complaints. And the judges were overwhelmed with the number of complaints that they had in their court. Everything from out of date uh, to, to health claims to marketing claims, it was really quite remarkable. So they asked me the question, how do you deal with this in America? <laughs> My response is, well, we don't let anybody go to court in America. And I explained to them how class action works and so on and so forth. They were very amused when my retort back to them was, you know what I think your problem is here in China? You have too much democracy. But it's, a, it's an interesting problem. And in China, there's still a lot of bad food, and there will be for some time now. But the efforts to deal with the problem is uh, creating some really interesting social uh, developments that are reflected in uh, legal chaos. Now, um, in our uh, examination between uh, social uh, values in the history of food labeling law, rather than focusing on the chronological development of food labeling law, I believe it's more helpful to focus on the thematic development. You can, of course, find very helpful chronologies of the development of food labeling law by consulting the FDA and USDA websites. These themes that I've listed here are listed in random order. And to varying degrees, the themes emerge and re-emerge in some interesting ways. Take, for example, the theme commerce of trade. As you will see in just a minute, this has been the foundation of much of early food law was to stop economic adulteration, a form of food fraud, which is the intentional adulteration of food by added weight, substitution, etc. Now, the regulation of economic adulteration has long, has historically been through the label, through weights and measures uh, in earliest times. We went through a period several years when enforcement against economic adulteration became a low priority. It has, it is now back in vogue. Again, thanks to the Chinese melamine scandals over pet food and infant, infant formula, which connected economic adulteration to food safety, to an FDA hearing to a recent GAO report, to a study issued by the uh, Grocery Manufacturers Association, 
to U.S. Pharmacopeia, now issue, issuing a recent report, and who is now developing standards for food, starting with pomegranates and then cinnamon, and most recently the horse meat scandal in the U.K. All of these are a form of, uh, re suggest the, this, this reemergence of economic adulteration as catching the interest of consumers, the media, and the food industry. Now, I'm going to come back to these uh, values, but for uh, ease of analysis, I have divided the history of food labeling into five phases. Now, mind you, this is overly simplistic, as these phases overlap and even reemerge in various forms, as I've just illustrated. But we have to have some sort of framework, and this seems uh, to help me at least. Let's start with religion. There is a story that starts out with, in the beginning. And it's, interestingly enough, it introduces us to the first food label, the forbidden fruit, marked so by God. Now, doing what many consumers do today, Adam and Eve ignored the warning label, and the rest, as they say, is history. Anthropologists have long monopolized the history of the connections between food and religion. But I think there's some interesting intellectual discoveries about the relationship between food and social values that we deal with today that stem back to early religious societies which, who restricted foods, celebrated foods, and created a connection between food and worship and food and society or culture. It may surprise some of you today that kosher is one of the fastest growing labels on the market. Food is unique. It speaks to us in different ways, in different forms, and different venues. Now let's move to, to commerce. As I mentioned, for centuries the role of government regulation of food was to address food fraud. As evidenced by the codes in the Roman Empire and medieval and early modern Europe, Early American regulation of labeling mirrored the use of these labeling codes and borrowed from England common law remedies all in response to food fraud. The Industrial Revolution and the attendant rise of science and technology exasperated the level of fraud and transformed the food system. An asymmetry of information between the consumer and the food marketer emerged and the relationship between consumers and producers evaporated. As a consequence, branding, the building of relationship between labeling, between the food manufacturer and the consumer emerged as a marketing tool. As a result of more sophisticated food fraud and the emergence of misbranding, public sentiment supported government action. And in 1906, Congress passed the Pure Food and Drug Act, the first federal anti-misbranding statute. The limitations to this 1906 act and the need for greater specificity led to the 1938 Food, Drug, and Cosmetic Act, which still serves as the foundation of modern food labeling regulation and in dealing with the problems of food safety. Now a shift to nutrition. A shift in the focus of food labeling regulation from food fraud and nutrition occurred as scientific evidence on the effects of nutrition on long-term health emerged. The accumulation of all of this attention was pressure on Congress to pass the 1984 Nutritional Labeling and Education Act, which required the disclosure of labeling on certain nutrition information and for the first time emphasized educating the public about means to intelligently uh, choose foods and interpret information via a label. As nutrition science advances the basic questions of how to convey useful information and consumers and what should be the role of education remain. I called Peter Hutt a couple months ago because I had a question about the term education in the act. Peter was the general counsel at that time to the FDA because there's not a mandate in the act that requires organized education. Education is limited really to the to the, label, the provisions that govern the label itself. And Peter told me that, uh, uh, in his forceful way, that um, there was no mandate, there was very little discussion. In his opinion, education was, at, was added as a PR move. 
and that at the time he told the agency that they really should have something in there with respect to education if they were going to call it, use education as a term in the act. But it's interesting to think about as we think about the value of education as a social value in respect to government regulation. Now, I want to move to food systems. While nutrition remains the centerpiece of food labeling, especially as obesity is a, continues to be a significant public health problem, a rise in consumer interest in the attributes of food has emerged. Evidence most recently by my home state, California, and the labeling initiative that would have required mandatory labeling of genetically engineered food. Now, consumer interest, again, as we sit back and think about it, it, it interest in attribute labeling, it should not be a surprise. Uh, in addition to its life-sustaining role, eating is also a cultural act. It's been that way since the beginning of time. The, the core issue for attribute labeling is the right to information as a means to influence production practice and establish a connection with producers. Values enveloped in the modern food movement and also reflect the historical confluences of food and culture. As the government grapples with how to factor into, into labeling credence values, the food industry in a myriad of ways, not surprisingly, attempts to communicate such information to consumers to build brand value and to establish trust. And so as we look at these social values, ask yourselves the questions. How do these values affect the history of food labeling law? From information to choice, consumer, interest, the industry, science, culture, technology, society, resources or the lack thereof, the connection between producers and consumers and consumers and food and consumers and culture, health, commerce, i.e. trade, nutrition and education. All of these are values that emerge at different times in the history of the food industry, in the history of regulation, in the history of consumers, and in, f and in the development of food. And all these values translate into some very interesting uh, dichotomies that I'd like to discuss here briefly before I open for questions. The free market versus regulation. Now, historically, this dichotomy reflects social values regarding the role of government regulation. Laissez-faire to a more robust, remost, more robust government intervention, especially that exhibited during the New Deal and following significant food problems, such as obesity. We now see more talk about government regulation to solve the public health problem of obesity. This is really a philosophical debate over the role of government and also over the resource limitations as the FDA continues to struggle. I was recently visiting with Michael Landa who heads CEFSON over labeling and we talked about the, the, the limited resources in dealing with FUNAPAC labeling and some of the issues that the FDA has grappled with because of the attention on FISMA, Food Safety Modernization Act, which is really s takes a lot of resources of the FDA, and there's only so many resources to go around. The free market is represented by those who are, are proponents of, of uh, products like raw milk. Um, in California, we've, we had a laws that recently passed that to ban foie gras and shark fins foie gras, much to the chagrin of the, my Francophile fin, friends. Um, these, are, these are issues that really bring out the, the question of government regulation versus free market concepts. Another interesting dichotomy is local versus uh, uniformity. This has long been an issue. Historically in London, for example, in the 14th and 15th century, uh, local regulations required each baker to have his own seal, and each loaf of bread was required to be labeled using the seal so the baker could be identified if there were cheating going on. The question has remained since then, the effectiveness of local or state regulation versus national uniformity. Uh, oftentimes local regulation becomes leverage to impose on a national basis uh, one's view. For example, again, 
the genetically modified food proposition in California, like Prop 64, uh, was very much acknowledged if it were to pass in California would have set the bar for the, uh, for the nation. Uh, it's difficult to package goods differently for California than, any, than everywhere else. Another uh, dichotomy, science versus culture, which I think is a very, a very interesting um, dichotomy. The entire global food regulatory system, if there is such a thing, is predicated upon free trade. Now, where does it start? Well, it starts with the World Trade Organization. In order to be a part of the World Trade Organization, you have to agree to play by the rules. I equate it to playing in a sandbox. To play in the sandbox, you have to agree to play by the rules. You have to get out of the sandbox. What are the rules? The rules are set by agreements such as the SPS, the Sanitary Phytosanitary Agreement, or the TBT Agreement. These rules are all predicated upon science. Science that is to eradicate trade barriers which partly consist of cultural ideas about food. Uh, and it's an interesting, it raises some interesting questions. Um, are, is there room, and what is the room for cultural credence statements? Yes, they must be truthful, but what if they do impose trade barriers? What if they're not based on science? Prop 37, genetically modified initiative, was really a cultural, a food cultural issue. Folks talk about safety. Safety's not really that much an issue when it comes to gene genetically modified food. Someone can talk about it, but scientifically it's not. But it really begs the question, what kind of food system do we want? Folks may oppose genetically modified food because they don't like the idea of intellectual property being owned by just a few companies. They may oppose it because they're concerned about biodiversity. They may oppose it for a religious reasons or ethical reasons. There's a lot of reasons that aren't necessarily captured in the scientific food safety regulatory regime that we built. Consumer protection versus consumer choice. If you think about it, all regulations make assumptions about consumers. When you think about a food law or food regulation, ask yourself the question. What, does, what assumption does this law make about consumers? Are all consumers idiots? <laughs> Do we mind if consumers make choices that are based upon irrational information? How important is choice? I recently uh, spoke at a conference in Atlanta on the legal implications of sugar addiction research. And one of the questions, fair enough, came from the audience. Someone asked me, look, in California, you're legalizing marijuana. And you're up here telling me that there's a chance that we may regulate sugar? Square the two together for me. Only thing I could say was, well, if we put add sugar to marijuana, then maybe we could accomplish the, <laughs> the regulatory dilemma we've created for ourselves. But how do, what is choice? And how, does it, how do we reckon with choice uh, with issues like raw milk and foie gras, and which I suppose could be is more of an animal welfare issue, I suppose. But these are, these are interesting issues. And what do we think about consumers? Public versus private standards is another interesting dichotomy. What are private standards? <laughs> private standards are gap fillers. The government because of this global food system, uh, cannot do it all. And there has been what I call a power shift. The farmers have never had power. Food manufacturers have had power. But where's, where's the real power when it comes to food? Think for just a minute about the derivative, derivatively called food product that you may have heard about in the news referred to as pink slime. Perfect, perfectly safe to eat. But what really caused the United States Department of Agriculture to, to step back on this? It was Target and Walmart and the retailers. This is where the new power comes in when it comes to food regulation. And these retailers, due to a consolidation 
due to private branding, because there's not as many of them, they're, they're not competing, not so much on price as they are on values, are creating this wave of private standards. It's really got to start in Europe, and now has moved to the US. And, and it's, it's, it's really interesting to see the implications of this, where the relationship between private standards and public standards. FISMA is now relying upon um, uh, third party uh, accreditation. I wrote uh, a couple book chapters a few years ago on the legal implications of private standards as it affects international trade. Developing countries have been opposed to private standards because they think it creates trade barriers. So it's really very, very interesting, very interesting. So these dichotomies and these issues, uh, I think if anything else, underscore how complex the legal issues are. They range from consumer law, it's really a multi-doctrinal approach to thinking about these issues. They range from consumer law, to food, to safety, uh, to choice, to First Amendment, to international trade. Uh, we've covered a lot of territory uh, in discussing this unique sector. Um, I think my time is up. I do want to save a little bit of time for questions. So if hopefully what I've, if, if, if we've accomplished anything at all, other than just confuse you, is to whet your appetite uh, and frame uh, the rest of the balance of, dis of discussion and presentations on what is food labeling law and how far have we come and what are some of these reoccurring uh, themes. Thank you. Questions? A quick note for questions. Can you please identify your name and if you have any affiliation with any schools or media? Also, a reminder, uh, this conference is being videotaped, so if you have a question that you don't want to ask in public, that's going to end up on the internet, you may as well ask that in one of the breaks uh, between sessions. Does that apply to me if I don't want to answer it in public? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I'll I go guess. Ahead. <laughs> Hi, uh, Alex Borshow. I'm at uh, MIT Sloan. Um, my question revolves around the ability of a food label to create a, a differentiated product, uh, and uh, that's a big kind of uh, question whether food producers will actually have uh, a business advantage in creating a differentiated product with a better label that consumers would want to see, and what do you think that the, the merits of that are? Well, I think that's, that's been a history of selling food. I mean, look, in the 15th century in Germany, uh, wine traders realized that there was value in creating, creating a brand for their food product. That's not ever leaving us. Uh, the question is, how do you do it in a way that's, that's rational, legal, and fair, that protects consumers, but also gives consumers the information that they want? And that's not always consistent. I'm not sure if I answered your question, but. Can you give them what they want and still get an advantage? Yeah, but, but the, the hallmark of food law in the US is that what you say has to be truthful. And that's where you get into lots of interesting questions. What is truth? What is puffery, for example, in comparison to if you, if you, if you puff, if you engage in puffery, is that so obvious that it's not true that it, that it becomes false? Or is it just a ruse? Is it making fun of something? Um, what is truth? That's, that's always, the, and, and we base that on science, right? And that's where science comes in and technology. Um, but that is the age old question and that really creates a lot of the conflict between government and industry. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. My name's Pete, I'm a consumer. Uh, relative to the GMO labeling that you mentioned, why do, does big business have such a, a feeling about having it on the labels? About, about not wanting it on not the Not wanting it on yeah. the labels, yes. That's a great question. And one that I've, uh, I've, I've had thousands of conversations with people on both sides about. The, the, ra the, the legal and scientific rationale is because if the, if the statement that this is genetically modified is on the label, then consumers will errantly assume that that product, that there's something wrong with that food product. Where the, uh, the FDA's pers uh, perspective is that there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing different 
There's nothing that distinguishes a conventional food product from a genetically engineered food product in terms of safety or quality. That's the rationale. So we don't want, so by putting it on a label, we would, in a sense, be misrepresenting to consumers. That's the argument. Now, still begs the question, are there other reasons to put it on the label, right? If people want to know. I will, uh, I will editorialize a little bit here, if you don't mind. I think that the, in my view, uh, look, the biotech industry has had a pretty good ride. <laughs> and if genetically modified food is going to save the world, which some of them have touted over the number of years, then they ought to sell that to the American people. It ought to be sold. Make the case. Convince people. Um, and they haven't done a very good, jo good job at doing that. But as a follow-up to that, um, in my reading, especially, for example, gen genetically, <clears throat> genetically modified wheat, when they are beginning to look at that and how the body is processing it, it is not the same wheat as our forefathers had. It's not the same, but you can say the same thing about conventional food products that haven't been genetically engineered. They're not the same as our forefathers have had either. Uh, it's, it's uh, look, I think it's a, it's, that's why I keep coming back to say, to, to my, uh, my premise, that really the question is a food systems issue. I don't, it, I don't think those who, are po those who are in favor of mandatory genetically engineered labeling, I don't think you're going to win on safety. It's going to be difficult to, to win on science. It's really a food systems question, in my mind at least. And I think it's a fair question to ask. Why, is, why are we not set up to accommodate that kind of interest? Other questions? The, the other thing about the California uh, proposition, I should add, was it was, it was terribly written. Um, it, they, uh, a huge mistake was made when there's a provision in the initiative that would have, that would have made any product that was labeled natural if it was processed at all, that would be a misrepresentation. And what that did is I think it, it turned what could have been an alliance with retailers. They had to oppose, not, not openly many of them, but quietly, they had to oppose the initiative. Because Walmart would wake up the next day and two thirds of its product would be out of compliance with the California initiative. And, and the, the folks who wrote the initiative argued that that was not a fair interpretation, but legislative counsel uh, made it pretty clear they thought it was. It actually went to court and it was a decision that was rendered that it was a plausible interpretation. But it was interesting because the retailers, I think, were in a real bind. Uh, but it was a poorly written uh, initiative. Now, it's, it's going to come up again. Uh, you know, Washington, Oregon, I know, has some interest. And, and, and the initiative was, uh, the supporters were badly outspent by the, uh, the industry. I think it was what, 40 million to four or something like that. Um, it was remarkable. I, I had, um, I thought initially it was gonna pass, but we had an interesting, in my class at UCLA, we had a debate on the eve of the vote with the students. And I purposely assigned the students on opposite sides just to mix it up a little bit. And I told my students, you may be the only 20 voters in California who know what you're voting on, on this initiative, but you will be informed. <laughs> and uh, the vote amongst the students were about two to one in favor of the proposition, even though it failed. So I thought that was interesting. Am I out of time? Okay, thank you very much.